Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Zoe, and you're listening to Climbing in Heels for your weekly dose of glamour, inspiration, and of course, fun. Today's episode is definitely one that's a little outside of my comfort zone and probably most people's, but I am so excited to have the amazing Emily Moores on the pod. You might know Emily from her incredibly successful podcast, Sex with Emily, or from one of her best-selling books, Hot Sex, Over 200 Things You Can Try Tonight, or Smart Sex. Emily is truly one of the pioneers in the podcast space, I think 20 years now, and her story is truly fascinating. So let's get right into it. I'm very excited to have you on. It's funny because (laughs) I would say don't ask Roger, but I would say I'm known to be a little bit like... I'm modest. I'm definitely like a modest person in the sense of, it's weird because on the one hand, I'm obviously not because I'm like loud and over the top and constantly making fun of myself, whatever. But I wanted to have you on because I think what you've done is I think you've really helped to normalize, to revolutionize, to make talking about sex, your sex life and everything else like basically like talking about what you ate for dinner. Exactly. (laughs) And so I'm very curious. I want to go back to the beginning for a second because, you know, I I don't think you woke up as a little girl and said, I'm going to be a sex therapist. So tell me a little like, (laughs) I, I love to know because Climbing in Heels is so much about really talking about the journey of all the amazing women that I speak to. And I think the journey is the hardest part, the most challenging and also the most exciting. And it is obviously what Mm -hmm. gets you to where you are now. So I want to talk about that. So tell me a little bit, like, give me you, give me Emily. Okay. Tell me. I'll tell you. Okay. So no, I did not come out of the womb talking about sex and knowing anything about sex. Just checking. Yeah. No, this was later, much later. Let's look at my third career. So (laughs) I, it's really, I was just looking. So I grew up in Michigan. Mm Mm-hmm in a suburb of Detroit. Yep. And I, yeah. And then, as you know, I grew up in Michigan. Then I went to University of Michigan. And in college, I was always, like, it always, it was really hard for me to pick a major. They were like, you have to pick a major, like, sophomore year. And I'm like, how do I know? Like, I love that you always knew what you wanted to do. I no. Were like, no, I was a psych didn't? major. I was a psych major. Okay, so was I. Psych so and so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you didn't you weren't always into fashion when you were a little girl. I was, but oh. at the time there was there was no world that I thought it could be a career and that I could ever make a dollar doing it. I I associated working with being miserable. Like I associated work with being like serious and at a desk and like what is your career path that's one of these 10 things. I did know that I didn't want to be corporate and sit at a desk yeah. and under fluorescent light all day and not be in the world. That I knew, right. but fashion, as much as I was obsessed with it, it was my passion, but I had no idea it could be a career. So yeah. that happened right. by right. accident. Well, you invented a path. You, and then you invented a path to, to get to live your passion. Well, I was um I was always working. So my parents grew up like I had a very strong work ethic. I had a, you know, I had my first job at 13. Wow. You know, working in clothing stores mm-hmm. in Michigan and doing little things like that. By choice or because college, you had to? Diff- like because there's to. a difference. You had to. Yeah. Okay. Because I wanted to like buy a car and a prom dress. Right. So okay. that's like basically it. So you weren't and a so, spoiled yeah. brat. That's great. I was not. No, no, I wasn't. <laughs> but you know, we had a good, no, I always, I was always told like that was a priority to work. And I went to college and I always worked really hard, but I was really looking for that thing. So like, you have to pick your major when you're a sophomore. I was like, how do I know? Yeah. I haven't done that much yet. Sure. But I picked psychology because I'm always interested in that. Mm-hmm. My, my family was a big advocate of therapy from a, from a young age for everybody. Um, so then I was, but my, my senior year, I was taking this poli sci class and it was all about women in politics which there were none there was two women in the senate and just a few in congress and i started getting very passionate about women being elected to higher office and so my senior year i was reading it was a year of the woman in in california and i graduated and i got in my car and i drove to san francisco and i my first campaign was i worked for barbara boxer on her first senate campaign wow so for 10 years i worked in electoral politics in san francisco (laughs) working for different candidates i know you had no right. So I was wow. very like in a suit every day, going to city hall, working on campaigns. Very, very different than where I am now. But the one <laughs> is that great? I know, right? Wow. Who knew? It's amazing, actually. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. 
so that was it. I was, and I loved, I did love working in, I loved mobilizing voters and getting people to, you know, educating them and working with the candidates, but it was crazy. It was like 24 seven. And then I worked for Willie Brown, who was being elected to the mayor of San Francisco. He was the first black mayor in San Francisco. And I was young. I was like in my twenties, but I, I really became, you know, part of the top of the campaign and started, you know, just getting people out to vote, organizing his inaugural, like I did at fundraising. And while I loved all that and it was insane, it still felt like it wasn't my passion. So my biggest thing when I graduated is like, what do I love to do? Because how Mm -hmm. I was raised was my mom always said to me, you know, my parents got divorced and my mom was independent. And your parents got divorced when? Like how old were you? When I was eight, when I was eight years old. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So that was, you know, that was tough. It was rough. And my parents got remarried to people that weren't great. So I was very, I've always been very, very independent. Mm -hmm. I know I've always been sort of about my friends. Yeah. You have to be. Yeah. I was raised to be like, this is, you know, everyone's kind of out for the make it, make it happen. (laughs) Very different than being raised now. It's like total latchkey kid (laughs) and working and all the things, not not, like a lot of independence. So then I was working. My parents divorced. Oh, my mom. So when I was, she's like, you know, she always drilled into me because I remember this one day when she, just gone divorced and she was, it was after her second husband and she had some financial stuff. She was a financial planner and she went on to be very, very successful. And she just retired at 79 during the pandemic because she couldn't work. So everyone in my family, my brother runs a really successful, um, he's a really successful lawyer in Michigan. So everyone has their own business. Everyone works for themselves. So my mom always said, you know, and I remember her standing over these, I haven't thought about this in so long, like these credit card bills that had piled up. And she says, you know, Emily, and she, she had this husband that wasn't a great guy and mm-hmm. things happened financially. She said, never, ever rely on anyone to take care of you. Mm-hmm. You always have to be out making you know, your own money and doing yeah. your own thing. And I, I remember I took that in my brain. I thought, okay, well, if I'm always going to be working, I better find my passion because I'm someone who can't phone it in. Same. Like, you know when I'm excited Same. about it. You know if I like you. You know if I want to talk to you. Same. I can't. I'm not like the kind of person who's like, oh, I just want to get along to get along. I, I can't focus if I'm not interested, you yeah. know, so I kept pivoting. So I was like, is it politics? Like first it was electoral politics. Then I, so then I um, pivoted and made a film about politics, a documentary about San Francisco politics. And that's kind of what led to what I do now. I started interviewing people because I was like, after working for somebody, I was like, what Wait, hold on. I want to back, I backtrack. Story. You made a yeah, documentary about politics, about yes. politics. Really and that led you to politics. San Francisco Sex politics, which led you to yeah, Emily. <laughs> I'm dying to know how politics led you to do. Something. Okay, <laughs> zero connection. Okay, so okay, because I, mean, anyway, I was like, so okay. It's a no, right? Like, because all these politicians. Yeah. Right? No, by the way, very, I was like, they're, hmm. they're polarizing. Mm-hmm. Well, it's funny because all my friends, because I was, it's a very small town, San Francisco. There's like less than a million people there. If you work in politics, everyone knows everyone, and they're like, what do you, what do you, what do you mean you're doing that? Because I was definitely on a career trajectory where I could, I knew everybody, I could run for office, I could mm-hmm. do all these things. But again, going back to my passion, it just didn't feel like it was my happy. own thing, and you I wanted happy. to create. Something. I wasn't happy. Yeah. Right. So I made this film and I realized, oh, I love interviewing people and I felt very comfortable in that position and telling stories. And okay, so at this time though, I'm dating, I'm in mm-hmm. relationships, I'm a serial monogamist, mm-hmm. but I always have these questions about, and this is since I was a little girl, I would meet couples and I'd say, how did you meet? <laughs> you know, tell me about your relationship. Mm-hmm. But just because I think where I, where, in my home, they weren't always so stable and yeah. interesting. So I thought, how do you stay in a successful relationship for so long? What is the secret to being happy and to being successful? And Sex. then by this time- <laughs> Sex. Well, people would always say, so no, Rachel, what I found out from many people was sex was the culprit. Of course. And I thought, how do you stay married mm-hmm. to somebody and want to have sex with same, the same person? Because like in my long-term relationship, right, it's a total mystery. And nobody, we're talking 2003. Yep. And there was nobody talking about it then. And I wasn't talking about it then either. I yep. wasn't like, guys... But I would start asking people and I realized there was this big hole of information where I knew my partner seemed to always be having a great time, Mm -hmm. but I wasn't having, I'm like, there's got to be more to this. Sex just got boring after a while to me for me too. And I thought, why would I get married and settle down with someone and be with someone when this is going to be a problem? So I really set out, they always say research is me search, or I always say that. And I thought, how do I get the answers? And so it was the, so at first I started, uh, 
a, a documentary series on like a reality series on cable TV in San mm-hmm. Francisco, which anybody can get a cable show, by the way. And wait, what Most year is this, Emily, around? Just so I understand. 2003. Oh, okay. 2003. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. And I started going around San Francisco interviewing people about their sex life and their relationships, like what makes great sex and what makes you mm-hmm. happy. And and then from there, I had an intern at the time who was like, there's this thing called podcasting. Why don't you start that? You don't need a camera. I'm like, that's amazing because it's the anonymity of talking about sex. So I did my first podcast in 2005. Didn't really know. Any. I hired a sound guy of Craigslist. He came over and I invited <laughs> a bunch of friends. Like single, married, dating, dating online. And I just interviewed people one by one about their relationship and their sex life. And I knew after that day, because all these pivots were like, what do I love? What's going to change the world? Like that was the other thing about politics. I felt like it was very meaningful and it felt important that if I'm going to be working, I want something that's really going to have an impact yep. because I think that's what gets keeps me passionate. And I just saw the people, I could see their faces and how they were opening up. And I was like, this is just fascinating. And I knew that day, it was kind of like how people say they find the one and they knew it. Yep. That's never happened to me in relationships. I don't even know that that exists. But in my work, I was like, that's it. I found it. I'm done. And I, for 20 years now, next year will be my 20th year. I've been um. That is doing wild. Podcast. That is yeah. wild. So you were doing podcasts before I even ever heard of a podcast. Truthfully, yeah, because didn't hear it. Yeah. well, I think for me, I was very obviously like television and media and all of that. And people would talk about podcasts, but I've never been a commuter, right? Here, because I always made a point to live within five minutes of where I needed to be. So I yeah. found that people, my, my, people in my life that were the biggest pod listeners were commuters, right? Because it was like their time and they could do whatever they wanted. I never had that time, right? And then I had kids and I was like, yeah, right. I'm going to sit there and listen to a podcast with my littles like running, you know? So (laughs) there's no time. No, but, but here's the interesting thing. So like, you know, so again, I was a psych major and I think like you, my obsession was talking to people. My obsession was learning about people's minds and what makes them, you know, tick and operate and why this and why that. I think, you know, from from knowing you the way I do, I mean, I think I think relationships are fascinating to you. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. relationships are everything. I'm learning more and more as an adult that the general word, because I think we always thought about the term relationship as a couple word, and it's actually not. Relationships are every single mm-hmm. thing with every person, every you mm-hmm. could have a relationship with your dog. Like it did like right. and those relationships really dictate your whole entire being, right? They do. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, sex really is the the to your point, it is the absolute, I think, core of a successful relationship. And mm-hmm. even just as a friend to so many like people in my life that have gotten divorced or whatever or a guy they like or whatever, trying to like a guy because they've been alone for so long. She's like, I just don't want to even kiss him. I was like, well, what? What are you doing now? Yeah, don't. Like, what? Okay, walk away. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, like walk away. Exactly. Well, you know, that's it. I mean, I was like, because here's the thing is, it's like it's so misunderstood too because we don't know. Yeah, we don't know what even makes good sex or why we get turned off from people and how you have longevity. Mm -hmm. And so I've literally become a student of it for 20 years. And it's like, I went back to grad school and I got my doctorate in human sexuality. I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Okay. So you did. So, so when I started, yeah, the first, so the first few years, it was like, wow, I'm going to help people. Like, we're going to like, we're going to get this information out there. I want to liberate the conversation around sex. There shouldn't be so much pain and suffering and taboo around it. Because when we talk about it and we come together as a community, we can actually help heal each other. We can help each other. I mean, the only conversations I had heard then is like, did you have sex with them? Did you not have sex with them? Mm-hmm. Was it good? Was it bad? Mm-hmm. But they're really, some of my friends were like, oh my God, I had crazy sex last night. And I used to always stop them and be like, back up. Like, what does that mean? Right. Can you, can you explain it to me? Uh-huh. Well, what does great sex mean? And it was always so different for people, always early on in the relationship. Mm-hmm. And I just really kept drilling down to try to understand what is the importance of sex? Because you're right, to your point, You know, we have relationships with everybody, but the people like otherwise you could live with someone, but if you're not having sex, they're just your roommate or your children or your parents. But when the sex comes into it, that's the intimacy. And so 
through all these years that I'm still always learning because it's always changing, you know, that we really, it was so shrouded in mystery mm -hmm. for so long. And I think we're just finally starting to realize that women deserve pleasure. We, mm -hmm. we should understand our bodies. Yeah. A lot of sex that we have is based on men's desires and not on female desires. Shocker. We <laughs> to, right? Exactly. Like everything we do, like even medications and healthcare, like they used to just mm -hmm. look at women and mm -hmm. be like, women are like small men. They could take pills like men can. It's like, no, we are very, very different humans but you know so like the clitoris wasn't even in the medical journals until uh, 1998 so it's like all these things so i just continue to unpack it and i just you know i love it i want people to you know help people prioritize their pleasure liberating the conversation because there's so much shame in, around sex too because people in relationships are like i don't know what's wrong i don't know how to sure. talk about it so people don't talk about it so that's been the mission and i and i it's but it's been you know a journey like starting a podcast in 2005 about a podcast which no one's ever heard of yep. and talking about sex in 2005 was a wild ride but it was something that I just knew, you know, when you know, I'm like, I don't, yeah. I know it's hard, but I just know it's going to work. So. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, I, I mean, you're helping so many people. I mean, are, so do most of the people that come to you, obviously outside of the podcast, but in your practice, like couples or individuals? Everybody, Everyone. couples and individuals. Ages? But I don't practice, Rachel. At all. Yeah, eight ages. No, I have to, I don't practice at all. At I all. have to say, I mean, but you did. Only, honestly, on my on my friends. Yeah, I yeah. did. On my friends, my friend kids. Oh, but then it's couples, it's women. I mean, my audience, so my podcast is so interesting because since the beginning, Rachel, it's been split men and women. It's always been 50-50. Right. And people always think it's all women, but it's men too because men. No, so, it's men. Talk about it. men. I sent someone to you. I sent someone to you, you recently. Did? I said, you need to call my friend Emily because <laughs> I can't help you with this. I'm like, I can try, but I can. <laughs> so like, I guess what I'm saying is like, I think some people only want to talk about it. Some people won't even mention it. I think generationally. Our parents would never. Very different. Never. Oh Are no. you kidding? Say the word sex in a room? What? Like, no, no way. I mean, my parents were very liberal, so they would. I used to find crazy books around my house. It made me throw up. But like, you know, I mean, you never want to know anything yeah. about your parents. It's ever. No. Well, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's what I'm trying to change, though, because our society is so like that. But if you normalize it. Mm -hmm. And you start talking about a young age more than just like the birds and the bees talk, then it becomes less weird and yeah. less. But but we're not there yet. There's literally only one place in the Netherlands, like in Amsterdam, they talk about it. They start teaching sex ed when kids are like pre-verbal about consent in their bodies. But we're a long Actually. way from there. But my people I talk to, it's like all my friends' kids, all my friends. Like the, the, you're, you sending your friend to me drops a bomb on you at a party. Clearly, it's been a problem for him if he's telling you. But like my brother called the other day. He's like, he's like some friend of mine just said she hasn't, you know, she's having problems since a baby. Can I give her your number? I'm like, sure. Because there aren't that many people, you know, really talking about it. where else do you go? And it's like, if you think about it, if we have problems in any area of our life, we have an expert to call. Like you got a toothache, you know, uh -huh. you call your dentist or you have something, your knee break, you call your, you know, knee person, whatever they're called again, your knee doctor. Yeah, but like uh, sex, orthopedist. Like this huge orthopedist, thank you, orthopedist surgeon. But with sex, it's like, and it's so multi-layered because we're early on, like people are like, I want a quick fix. What's the toy? What's the position? What's yeah. the lube? Yeah. But sexual health <laughs> is part of your wellness. Yeah. If your brain, if you have you know, confidence issues, you're on a certain mm -hmm. medication, you know, all these things are going to impact sex. So it's, it's complex. But that's really interesting, actually. I want to talk about that because I think mental health, I think has really, uh, I think now talk about stigma. I think, I think mental health is the thing people are most talking about. So it's very yeah. interesting what you're saying at like what a link it is, because to me being a psych major, and I always argue the point that I've been practicing every day since because being a stylist <laughs> for my whole adult life, boy, that's a that's a psychiatric experience. So, um, <laughs> um, psychological experience. Um, but I I think um, or both. But I do want to just talk about that because I think that what you're doing has changed the game. I think it's helping really destigmatize, normalize, democratize. <laughs> You know, the conversation, I know, you know, Gwyneth and Goop, and I know you've you've been on there a bunch. Mm -hmm. And I think all of these things, but I I think you're now going on like 
today's shows and talk shows and yes. like being on morning television. And I think that it's amazing. And I wanted to have you on the pod because I feel like so much, so many of the women I talk to, you know, they're game changers in a lot of different fields. And I feel like you've obviously really changed the game here, the conversation. And I remember when I first met you, I mean, I'm pretty sure we were talking about sex within five minutes. And I was like, this is so funny because like anyone who knows me is like, Rachel talked about sex, like what? And I think it's, again, I think it because growing up, you're sort of like, ladies don't talk yeah. about that, right? And not that my mom was like, you need to sit straight and walk like a certain lady. It was just sort of, I think it was considered to not be okay or classy to do such a thing. Yeah, and I it think wasn't. I, it wasn't. And I think now it's more intelligent and less trashy and more, I don't know. I think it's just, I think it's becoming normal. You know, I think it it's is. becoming it normal. It is. Um, yeah, I, after 20 years. I, I, it is, right? And they are t- yeah. they are yeah. talking about it at a young age in school. They're starting in third grade for sure. So it's amazing. But you think that this is really impacting mental health, right? Yes, absolutely. It's confidence. I mean, here's the thing is that it's confidence. And it's so I wrote this book last year called Smart Sex, mm-hmm. How to Boost Your Sex IQ and Own Your Pleasure. Mm-hmm. And I realized when I was writing the book that it was all my best tips because people come in for tips. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's 20 years. And then I realized that it's so whenever someone so a lot of on my podcast on sex with Emily, people call with questions. Or they, I get hundreds of questions a day. And I realized that when they ask me a question, I have to kind of go through this, um, like these five, I, in my mind, I would go through these five pillars, like how, how in your body, the first was like embodiment, like, are you in your body during sex or yeah. are you leaving the room? Are yeah. you fantasizing? What's your health like? If you're not moving your body, you're not in a healthy place, you're not eating great foods, that's also going to impact your ability to feel aroused and turn mm-hmm. on. If you're stressed, do you know the three biggest killers of our sex drive are stress, trauma, and shame? Like if you're stressed and anxious, you got a spike in cortisol, it literally cannot live with being yep. turned on. They yep. don't cancel each other. So if you're running all day, you're like, why can't I get yep. up in the bedroom? It's like, because you actually are stressed. So there's just knowledge that people don't realize. And then the first one, yeah, so your health and wellness, your health, and then it's your collaboration. How well do you communicate about sex? So most people, Rachel, never talk about sex like we're saying. Mm-hmm. And then they don't certainly don't talk to their partners about it. So mm-hmm. then they expect their partner's a mind reader. They mm-hmm. should know what they want. So I, you know, and the next one is self-knowledge. Like how well do you know yourself? Like I had to realize I know that there's certain times a day, maybe where I want sex. A lot of times I don't. And people assume that I'm like having sex all the time. No, I'm like no. everyone else. That's like me Plenty getting dressed and changing sex. 20 times a day. Exactly, Hell no. Rachel. <laughs> Hell no. Hell no. I, I'm like, are you kidding? Like I do not want sex. All. In no. fact, I, I know what I do. What I do know is I know how to handle it when I don't. I know when and I want it, when I don't, what has to be happening. Like if it's That's cold so in the house, there's no way. If it's past 10 o'clock in the weekday, no. You know what I'm saying? So I sit down the barrier. But people make assumptions. It's just that, no, I know how to help people and help myself. Just literally think about it's like food. Like if you go yeah. to somebody and you're like deciding where to go, you're like, I know that I don't like the food here, uh-huh. but I like it here. And same thing with sex, but we just never – think about it because we just think it should, it's like this mysterious it thing. It is the and mysterious thing. Close our eyes and hope yep. for the best. It's like, you don't have to. It's like I help people kind of crack the code on that so they could be their own best advocates for what they want. And it is related to mental health because if we're depressed, if we're anxious, not feeling good in our bodies, all the things, which is a lifetime journey, by the way, you never get to all five pillars and feel like now I'm the most sexually intelligent person out there. It's just a way to understand where you're at and then how to connect more with yourself and, and with your partner. But yeah, the I'm journey. so fascinated. It's so, um, it's, it's so impressive, honestly, and, and fearless in a lot of ways. Cause again, like I think anyone who can demystify and open up the, you know, conversation, but really make it like every day. I mean, I think it's, it's not easy. It's not easy no. thing to do, you know, but yet it's the thing that everybody needs to talk about. <laughs> so. They need to. Yeah, they do. They feel better. Like that's the thing about listening to the podcast. People say to me, like, oh, we, I, my boyfriend and I were driving on a 12-hour road trip and we listened to your podcast the whole time. And I was like, <laughs> that seems like a lot of time listening to my voice. But it's because if you listen a few times, it's going to, you know, it normalizes. You're like, oh, she talks about it like, you know, Sunny with a chance of orgasms. <laughs> we can do that. We can talk about it. That's not a problem. So yeah, I helped to normalize it. But the whole business, like I'm an entrepreneur like you, that part has not been easy. You know, I've been doing this for 
on my own, raising, you know, by the bootstraps, building a, a brand, a business around it has been, you know, that's a journey for sure. And how many but books do you have, Emily, people. now? You have more than one, no? I have two books. You have two books. I have two books. Yeah. Yes. And um, can books. you tell our listeners what they're called? Because I think everybody's going to run out and grab it after yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> one's called Hot Sex. Um, one's called Hot Sex and one's <laughs> called Smart Sex. I'm pretty yeah, sure all I, the dudes are buying Hot Sex. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's good. It's actually pictures. It's great. It's like it's 10 years old. It was time for another book. It's like a lot of pictures. I'm like, don't even, you don't have to read. Just see what to do. That's We all need tips, Rachel. We never got tips or we did or we watched porn or we... We just you know, figured it just, out, girl. We just, we just figured it out. It's it so different. It's well, kind of better though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. But I mean, something I, I think probably a lot of people ask you or would want to ask you, how do you suggest in this day and age, and I know you don't have your own kids, but I know you're around a lot of kids and love kids. Yeah, but a lot. How, what is your best sort of advice on how to talk to kids, what age, or does it vary based on your, like, what, what is your, like, okay. give me your, your thoughts on how, because I think that is the real struggle for parents because the internet now has pretty much done all the work and not in a good way. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And so here's the thing. I, I love the U.S. It's now that all my friends have teenagers and mm -hmm. kids, this is like, I, I spend a lot of my time helping, figuring this out. So, and I'm, is that, well, first, the biggest challenge why it's so hard for parents is because we haven't quite, well, first, we were never we given sex education it. and we've got issues around it too. Mm -hmm. We've like, we're like, maybe we have shame around it or maybe we grew up in a religious upbringing where yep. it wasn't okay. And so we have to figure out why we're uncomfortable with it too, but it's also okay. So like the best way to start with your kids is to say, you know, and your kids are 12 and mine are, are, mine are and just 13 and just 10. Just to 13, 10. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, we got to – so it would mean like when you are watching something on TV, for example. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're watching something and you see something and you – it's like using social media or using media to ask them a question. So mm -hmm. let's say you're watching something and there's a relationship. Yep. And let's say there's a couple that kisses or something happens and you're like, okay, you could stop the TV and be like, so what do you think of that relationship? Mm -hmm. what, what does that make you think? Do you guys have any – you know, what, what do you think? Yeah. And then just, just, you start, even though they're young and they're like, oh, gross or whatever they do. Oh, when no. they see people Kaya know. said to me, mommy, that's how you made me. Right. Like when they kiss, that's how you and daddy made me. Right. Yeah. And then, and then you just pushed me out and I came out with a big smile. Yep. Kaya says exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Daddy and yeah, I good. looked at each other and then right. <laughs> But but well, Skylar, that, funny so enough, is was, like, I know everything, mom. No. Don't worry. They don't know. I mean, because what they're learning, the mechanics. But so you use examples and you say, yeah, well, you know, there's a little bit more to it than that. Yeah. Um, would you like to, you know, and then you do just you sort know? of, it's, it has to be, do you want to know? Mm -hmm. Do you want to know know what happens? You know how I have a, I have a vagina and your dad mm -hmm. has a penis. I mean, I know it sounds like. But you just give it to the age, you give them the information at the age, it's like commensurate with their age. Right. And you just continue to listen and you ask questions and you use things. And so when they say something like that, you could say, well, let me just tell you actually what happens. Right. But you don't have to have judgment around it. You sure. just sort of keep going. And you could even say, you know, what's so cool right now is that my parents didn't talk to me about it because it was, you know, it was, a, right. it was a different time. So I'm learning too. I'm figuring out the best way to parent you on this because I want you to have all the information. But even at this age, talking to them about puberty, like letting them know what Wild. to expect that you might have, you know, you might start to feel at night, start to mm -hmm. feel, you know, your, your penis gets hard or you'll yeah. have a dream or this thing will happen. I know, but you have to and be like, that's totally okay. And just, you know, if you have a question about it, you can ask me about it, but I want you to be expecting that it's because you have hormones and your body starts to change at this time. And you might have be having these thoughts and I just want you to feel okay. And you have to bring it up often. Like it's like not every day. But the more repeated you are and the more you normalize it, the more comfortable they're going to feel to ask you questions. And if you don't know the answer, it's okay to say, let me get back to you on that. But I'm so glad you asked me. Mm -hmm. I did that yeah. once with my little oh. one because he asked at such a young age. And I was like, what do you want to know? <laughs> you know, and we kept it. Yeah. We kept it light. <laughs> we kept it. We kept right. it light. 
I think I went to an animal reference. I think because they're really into okay, animals okay. and they know animals and they understand that. So I was like, okay. And and then I was <laughs> right. like, let me know when you want to know more. You know? <laughs> like that was it. Yeah. But sometimes they don't know. So it's kind of like like a lot of girls we talked about, about their periods, right? Mm-hmm. We talk like girls will start for developing breasts. Yep. And, you know, boys, you could say to them, you know, that you might have a growth spurt yeah. or you might, you know, have a penis that grows or your voice changes, you know. The whole thing. Sometimes they have wet dreams. You could say you might get have wet dreams and this might happen in your sleep. But you just are giving them the facts and you're just saying this things could be happening. I want you to know that it's totally normal and you can ask me anything about it. But the problem is sometimes we don't know the questions to ask. Like my mom always said to me you know, if you have any questions about sex, ask me. And much like your son, I was like, oh, I know it all. But we really, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So they might ask him like, why don't I have, you know, pubic hair yet? You can yep. everyone develops at their own time. So it's just, you can hit it's me It's just too, navigating. Rachel, anytime. <laughs> I was like, I was like, or if but- you're lucky enough to know Emily, you just punt them to Emily too. To t- <laughs> But I would love it. I talked to my nieces. I was literally on a Zoom last week with my niece and like 25 of her friends in college. Like her That is sisters. like the cutest thing in the whole entire I love world. it. I pull out my vulva puppet and I'm like, <laughs> you know, that's, that's right behind me. I'm like, because they don't know. I'm like, okay, here's your vulva. Like, this is your clitoris. I've been showing them and then I have the penis. Because they all want to know how to please their partners. I'm like, okay, but this is your vagina. They all look different. I literally do. I'm like, can't they're they like, Aunt Emily. I'm like, can't they just figure no, Can't you just Rachel, navigate? They don't, no. They really – they don't want to look between their legs. Women are grossed out. I mean, here's the problem with women. We are so disconnected from our bodies that we walk around like, we hate my bodies. My That's thighs true. are rubbing together. I, don't, I feel fat. And then we're like – but we think that we should just get into the bedroom and feel amazing mm-hmm. and know what to do if we don't spend the time being our own best. Well, I want to – okay. So I don't want to take all your time, but I want to just ask yeah. one more thing. What What is the most common issues that you're presented with? Like what what are people constantly like wanting you to talk about? Like for women in their like 40s or 50s like is there like I guess what I'm saying is like in relationship podcasts or 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 just in general in counseling or anything else it seems to be there is a midlife crisis right like there that is a very real thing right and whether that's yeah. 40 whether that's 50 whether it's 55 but I would imagine and just from like the people in my life yeah there is common threads as to okay. sex drive what going do you hear? down. I just hear a lot of like disinterest. There's a lot of medications people are taking for it, like anxieties and different things. And that obviously, I'm sure you know this better than anyone, impacts sex drive. So I think yeah. I'm curious sort of what the most common threads are that people come to you, like females, like age guys. I, I mean, I can sort of figure that one out. But like, yeah. I think it, I'm curious. Girls are like women... Yeah, women want to know, yeah, why they're not as turned on anymore. Right. Why that? Yeah, their libido. They don't mm-hmm. want to have sex as much menopause. as we get older. Peri- perimenopause, mm-hmm. menopause. They want to know why they're just like dry everywhere and why they don't. Yeah, feel great or weight gain and all these things happen. So really, I'm a big advocate for um, HRT or hormone replacement therapy right. for a lot of women. There was a lot of. Um, there was actually a really you know bunk study that came out in the early 2000s that that said that it was bad for women to take estrogen for which many, many years before that women were. So for the last 20 years, women were not getting this relief that they need because they were told that it was directly related to cancer. But we have found out now that it's really not. It's really safe for most women to at least take vaginal estrogen because it doesn't really transfer as much into your into your body, but it, it. you can just use it. So anyway, I tell women to, also if you're on a medication or you're on an antidepressant, that is going to impact your sex drive. So I think that what we find is later in life is that, and this is always the case, to be honest, because mm-hmm. I hear from women in their 20s, like yeah. I moved in with my boyfriend two years ago and now I don't want to have sex. <laughs> so that's my challenge is that my listeners are all ages. You ask yeah, me, like they're literally 18 to 85 Wow, and they're all ages. And I think because it's so mysterious and we don't yeah. really, we never really yeah. like, understand all of it. So I think at all ages, it's like you get to decide what actually sex means to you. And the other thing is that so much of sex, again, is for, was based on a male's pleasure, like 
procreation. Mm -hmm. You can only have sex in this one position, but that's the position that actually doesn't feel the best for most mm -hmm. women. And women don't have as much pleasure that way. So I just ask women, like, figure out what you actually like. Buy a vibrator. Mm -hmm. Be okay not having sex as often, too. Like, there's no, like, sex police that's going to knock on your door and be like, I hear you're only having sex once a month. Like, only, what's wrong Only with your you? husband. Like, only, only your husband well, or your boyfriend. Well, then we – exactly. Well, then you got to say, like, this is actually what I need to feel. And that's what I talk about in my book. Like, figure out what you – if you still think that sex is important. Because some people are like, I'm done. I'm out. I've had enough. Mm -hmm. I actually don't ever need it again. But if you're like, no, I'm really curious on how I could start to like it again or start to get into it, then – then I've got tons in my book. My, my that's what I talk about all the time. Like you got to break it down into, it's not just one thing. Like I could give you a million positions and toys and sure. loops, but at the end of the day, it's an inside job. Sure, you know, like everything. So figuring so that out. So layered. It's so layered. It is. And so, you know, that's what I'm so glad you're having me on talk about. But also, like, yeah, I mean, it's so layered. But it's it's so layered, but it's it, you know, it's been a it's been a journey. But also just being, you know, having the business around it too, and trying to it's amazing figure out how to help more people when there's still so much shame around it. Like even the world is opening up to it, but there's still like sponsors or brands or like, yep. I'm not going to touch it. No. You know? So, so there's still shame. Like some parties, people come up to, you can tell when you go to a party, like, like people go to dinner party and there's like half the rooms, like I have a question and the half the rooms like leaving the room because they don't want to talk to you. Right. It's like, of course, affronting. So that's so wild. But yes, it's, it's absolutely 100% true. Um, and I think getting less so, you know, even just saying the word vagina Definitely. was like a thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like really a Definitely. thing. Like if, if you someone says say it on that television. No, no. Hell no. But somehow penis is yeah, more acceptable. It is. When I started, I couldn't say it anyway. I used to do television and radio. Like you can't say it. You can't say penis, vagina. You can't say masturbate. They were like nothing on the radio. And you couldn't on TV and the morning shows. They were like, you can't. Like you can come on, but you have to say intimacy. You know, it's like and are they just, letting you say it now? Markets. They are. They're letting me bring vibrators on. It's wow. changed. It's been, ah, I know. See? It's a whole new day. Get it, Emily. Get <laughs> it, you wait Emily. Long you wait long enough. If you wait long enough, people are ready for you. Oh, I guess. Yeah. Well, I love having you on. You're yeah. such honestly, you really are such a game changer. And I I love that that you do this. I think so many people are grateful that you do this. I think many people are grateful and cult followers of Sex with Emily. And I think you're really important for young people. Older people, yes, yes but I really think that young people really need to, to really need you the most, honestly. <laughs> Because it is yeah, this you know, weird thing. It's this weird thing. It's a weird thing to talk about. It's still this very like, she's a slut. He gets all the girls. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, what is a slut? Like what? Okay, why is she a slut? Like all, all the things, right? And and then yeah. it's sort of like, what does that even mean? And what should we be doing? And how is it? You know, it's really hard. How can it be respectful versus trashy? And how you know all all the things. So I think that's mm -hmm. a whole nother layer and a whole nother book for you. Just saying. Yeah, no, it is, Rachel. And I have to say that is my greatest passion right now mm -hmm. is talking to young people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I do these little programs. So the problem is, though, parents, you have to, to teach kids it. about sex. No, you have to get parental yeah. signature. Yeah, of course. To get, yeah. so, we so have to sign it for school. 18, <laughs> yep. So 18 and over, though, like I do these little boot camps for women before they go to school and college, like women, and I, and I've done that the last few years, wow. just kind of tell them what they need to know. And you. I go around to college campuses. And so really though, at the end of the day, my, cause this is like our future, these youth that need to know. So yeah. I, that is something I'm developing right now. I'm, I'm developing a course. And if anyone's listening and they're interested, yeah. like they can just, you know, email me, DM me. But um, we are developing a course for parents and for kids because I know it's awkward. I'm like, yeah, just tell your kids about this. It's not fucking easy. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not like, yeah, just, do this, turn off the TV. It's just, it's so, because parents, again, have to work through their own stuff. Like I'm literally not, there's very few people who are doing what I'm, that's why it's so interesting yeah. because they're all coming up against it now, but like, what the hell do I do? Yeah. So I know that I'm, I'd love to tell parents just like, take this course I'm creating and well, you know, I also we'll think, get there. I also think kids don't want to necessarily talk to their parents they and don't. then they also don't want to sit there in a classroom with their peers. So like. It's so, right. What do you do? And then they might find porn on their phone. Right. And you don't know they found porn. Right. And they think that's sex. They're like, that is not sex. That is a that is a movie yes. that was created by a man for a man and it's scripted. So like, no, that's not sex. So the problem is when kids are like, well, why? 
if that's not sex, what is? And then yep. you're like, oh, how do I explain this? Yep. So I'm on it, Rachel. I'm on it. Good. I'm developing programs. Good. I because love it. it really, it, it, it's a problem. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful for you. This was so much fun. I love what you're doing. And I'm obviously everybody Thank loves you. what you're doing. All right, you guys, everyone, Sex with Emily, you got to listen. <laughs> you got to listen. Check it out. And get her new yeah, book. Get her you. new book. All right, love. Thanks. Have an awesome day and a great week. Thank you so much to Emily for being on Climbing in Heels. Truly, her work to destigmatize sex and change the conversation around it is so important. Yes, for us, I think as adults of any age, to me, I think even more so for young people. Because I think just the way we all grew up was like, don't talk about it. Don't mention your private parts. Don't mention this. Different nicknames for all your body parts. And don't talk about it in school. Don't mention it to your friend. Definitely don't say that around your dad. You know, that kind of thing. And I think that ultimately, to Emily's point, I think it really impacts your mental, your emotional health and just your confidence in yourself, how you carry yourself. And like, I think similar to the way that I've always approached fashion and style and people's fear of it, you know, and the way that I truly believe it affects your confidence. I believe it's the same here, honestly. And I think the more that we normalize it, the more that we really lift the stigma off it, say the words, talk about it in a room and make it normal. I think the more relaxed and normal it will be and the less weird and the less invasive and the less scary to everybody. So I want to thank you all so much for listening to Climbing in Heels. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the iHeart app, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss a single episode this season. It's going to be so good. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at, at Rachel Zoe and the show at Climbing in Heels Pod for the latest episodes and updates. I will talk to you all soon. Mwah.